Hello, everybody. We are here with Mohamed Al Sayek. You might be wondering why this connection between two people from two very far away countries, two small countries. Uh, Mohamed is from Kuwait. Um, I'm from Uruguay. And the link is because, um, in a sense, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has brought us together um, because we, as a company, work in home automation and we make a product to make home uh, really smart. And Mohamed contacted us to help him in his uh, free time during the pandemic uh, to make all the magic in his home. Is that right, Mohamed? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, technology made us uh, feel like we are close together. Yeah, like the like it's the, if the world is just a very small place, right? Yes, you know. And uh, before the pandemic, I ne I never knew some you know the uh, things like this was easy or to conduct a meeting using virtual uh, technology. But a lot of people use it for everything now. Even if you go to a doctor, you can. Meet him uh, through uh, uh, virtual uh, meeting. So many, many things happen in the pandemic, not just bad things, yes. I think some yes. uh, positive things as well. Um, in Uruguay, we don't know much about Kuwait, and uh, we would like to know a little bit. Um, we know it's a small country, we know the population is similar in size to Uruguay, but in a sense, uh, you have the Kuwaitis, which are only 30% of the population, and the, the other 70% are people from abroad. So it will be nice that you explain to us something that looks very different from our point of view. Well, this uh, part of the earth, uh, uh, according to historians, has been inhabited uh, maybe <clears throat> somewhere around 8,000 BC or something by different... Wow. Uh, it was under uh, the the let's say uh, the umbrella of the Portuguese uh, Empire, I think, uh, uh, and uh, until the late seventeenth century. Uh, and these are let's say we're not going to talk about the past. We're going to talk about the modern, yes. uh, the founding of the modern Kuwait, which uh, which is approximately. In the mid 1650s to the uh, towards or towards the end, and uh, it was uh, <clears throat> um, a, um, a port city um, uh, 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 con uh, conducting, uh, let's say, uh, uh, shipment and uh, and uh, the flow of goods to the uh, uh, regional areas. For example, to Basra, which is in Iraq, and uh, uh, to, uh, to the part of uh, the Middle East towards Saudi Arabia. So, so it was a very important, uh, let's say. But when, when you were considered like a country, when, when, when is Kuwait, Kuwait, uh, and not well, maybe part of some uh, other? Um, actually, the first name, of Kuwait, I think, came in the 1650s or 1700s. I'm not exactly uh, sure, but it was in the late uh, 16, uh, 16th uh, or, or 17th uh, century. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, it was ruled, I think, since the mid uh, uh, 70, uh, 1750 or 1800s by the al Saba family. And from then till now, uh, it's, uh, it has been ruled by the same family. Um, we have a situation here that more or less in Uruguay we exist because we, we are in between two in our recent superpowers, Brazil and Argentina. So, mm. so the clashes between the, the Portuguese and, and the Spanish, uh, they they actually needed some sort of uh, buffer in the middle. Is there any such things for Kuwait because well, we are between very, Iraq and Saudi Arabia? 
it is very similar. We have only two neighbors, land, I mean, uh, sharing our borders, uh, land borders is Saudi Arabia and Iraq. And of course, from the other side across the sea, Iran. So basically, we existed with three uh, big, powerful countries. And we're like a triangle uh, in the middle, you know, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Kuwait always maintained a good relationship with its neighbors. Uh, of course, uh, uh, what happened in 1990, the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq, there was always, uh, let's say, uh, Iraq was always uh, being a powerful country. And uh, they always wanted to, uh, let's say, expand because Kuwait is a very wealthy country and this one to, uh, to, let's say, to take part of it or to invade, you know. And it happened even once in the 1960s but, uh, or late 1950s. Uh, when Iraq was threatening to invade Kuwait, but it was uh, uh, stopped uh, uh, through the British uh, uh, British Empire or the, the British uh, forces at, at the time. Yes. And then it happened again in 1990. But uh, of course, I remember very well during this time, uh, I was around 12, 13 years old, but uh, I remember very well how... Uh, let's say, scary it was to wake up in the morning and you had to have your country invaded by other people. Uh, and uh, a very aggressive, uh, let's say, uh, uh, very aggressive invaders where they were killing people, women and children. And uh, of course, uh, we are, uh, on this day, it was uh, 30 years ago, it was the liberation of Kuwait. So we are celebrating the 30th year of the liberation of Kuwait. So do you think now everything is more stable and conditions yes. for things like this to happen is not? Uh, no, it will, it, it, uh, I think whoever did it in, uh, before, he got a very good lesson. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it gave a good lesson or it, it gave a good uh, uh, I mean, who, of whoever is thinking to do it again, you know? So um, I mentioned uh, that your population is composed of 30% Kuwaitis and 70% people from overseas. Can, yes. can you explain us uh, how a, a country functions this way? Well, uh, of course, the uh, uh, population of Kuwait is small. It's around... Uh, 1.3 million so and the working or let's say the workforce or the working population i, th I think uh, they're around uh, 400,000 because uh, you have elderly retired and kids you know so if you take them out you have this is let's say uh, the engine of kuwait you know and of course uh, to 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 invest this uh, this vast wealth and to have the economy working, uh, you need to uh, get experienced people, expats from uh, from outside Kuwait, to also to help you out uh, in uh, in the growth of uh, of the country. This is number one. Number two, uh, also uh, during uh, let's say. Uh, let's say, I call it the golden age of Kuwait, which is late 1970s to 1990. There was uh, tremendous growth and new roads being built, uh, and new residential, residential areas being built, you know, and uh, the only way to do it is uh, to get uh, uh, people from abroad, uh, uh, South Korea, China, uh, uh, India, you know, uh, also Egypt, uh, and uh, and and if you look at the pictures of Kuwait before 19, 
let's say 70 and after 1970, you see this, let's say, uh, like um, uh, big changes happen, huge changes. Um, and then post the invasion also we, the population grew, uh, more areas need to be built, you know, and uh, it's, it's just the way it is, you know, uh, the composition of the, of, uh, uh, of the population being 30, 70 or 35, 70, 65, that's the way it is. It is getting, let's say, uh, smaller by the time, you know, let's say, uh, let's say now they are talking of, let's say, changing the, the, uh, the, the demography of the people. Uh, but uh, who knows, you know, it's uh, still we are living to, to, uh, together, you know, as, uh, as um, let's say, as a family. And how, what, what happens uh, during the pandemic? Because, uh, um... well, during the pandemic here, where the government realized that we had the system does not, let's say, absorb uh, this amount of people. I'm, I'm a lot of foreigners, they were staying in um, small uh, places, congested with people, which was normal to do before the pandemic, but not after the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. where social distancing is essential sure. to, uh, let's say, uh, to survive. Yes. And therefore, they are, they are making new measures that this will not be happening in the future, where, uh, let's say, the maximum amount of people are staying in particular unit. So now, now uh, Kuwait is, is a very modern country. I've seen pictures on the sky rise, and, and you have an amazing opera house. And I don't know if you have a lot of tourists going to Kuwait. Um, I know you are more liberal than your neighbors. Uh, you have um, a constitutional country, um, check and balances. Uh, uh, they say semi-democratic. Uh, what can you tell us uh, in particular about all this? Well, uh, let's say uh, uh, the, 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 the system of let's say, or the relationship between the people and uh, uh, let's say the, the ruling family, even before the constitution was a very close relationship, family oriented relationship. And, uh, and in 19 and after, because Kuwait was a British protect, uh, uh, let's say under the British protection, uh, not a colony, but a protector and uh, mm -hmm. till 1960 and uh, it, it was uh, it became independent after that and from that time there was a constitution being drafted by prominent people uh, and uh, by famous uh, legal scholars and uh, it, 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 it made the policy of how the relationship between people and the ruling family and the government, uh, uh, it, it made this policy of how they interact with each other and what is the check and balances uh, to be done and you know what powers people have and what powers the ruling family have and what power the government have, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, we are very lucky in this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, being in this region and being a small country and being the first country to have this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, constitution. Mm -hmm. yeah, you are also a very rich country because uh, you discover a lot of oil around the 40s, we, I believe, no? Well, well you know, uh, we, we are part of the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, which consists of six countries, us, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Oman, uh, Qatar, and Bahrain. And uh, uh, of 
course, uh, uh, we share diff very similar culture, uh, very similar uh, accents, very similar way of life. And, and we are also, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of people, they marry from, you know, each country, you know, and uh, so there is a lot of family, uh, let's say, being uh, connected with these countries. So you can travel to any country with your just ID, you know, without a passport. And uh, Kuwait was the second oldest country for uh, discovering the oil. The first is Bahrain. Uh, but uh, Bahrain, they depleted their reserves very quickly. They had very small. And uh, Kuwait was uh, the second country, I think, and then later on, Saudi Arabia. So uh, since the late 30s until uh, Kuwait was uh, independent in 1960, there, uh, uh, most of the oil... Uh, uh, being uh, uh, discovered was uh, was shared between Kuwait and the British uh, the British Empire at, at the time, and after 1960, it was 100% for Kuwait. And since then, and since the Constitution, a lot of money was being poured in, into education, into 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 the health system, into uh, the welfare of people. You know. And uh, and uh, therefore, you know, it's uh, 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 still, of course, Kuwait is one one of the major exporter of oil, crude oil. Mm -hmm. I think it holds uh, around uh, one fifth of the world reserve, or yeah. e even a little bit more. And and you made a farm with 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 the, with a lot of the money of the of the oil exports you made a fund so 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 that you will not only depend on this industry but also on, on good investments and, and thinking about the future and, and i think you were involved in that in, in part of your life right yes well uh, actually uh, i uh, the fund was started by decree uh, in uh, the mid 70s i think and uh, and what it did, it it invested the uh, portion of uh, of uh, the income from oil. I think it was ten percent to this fund, and this fund is independent of. And it used to be a very, let's say, a secret and uh, uh, fund where. Uh, because Kuwait, as, as I told you, was a small country with uh, big neighbors, so so it it was investing money, but uh, uh, without the big media at the time of hype. And uh, one of the major investment it, it made it was in uh, I think at the time British Petroleum in the UK, uh, Mercedes Benz in Germany. You know so. Th the fund grew to a hundred billion dollars uh, before 1990, which was the biggest wealth fund at the time. And, and uh, because of that fund, uh, or because of that wealth, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, or the invasion happened because Saddam Hussein so, so it was not a secret to him. Demanding, demanding either a $10 billion being paid to his country for no reason, or I will take actions. And of course, uh, they will not pay him this amount of money because uh, you have, you know, because it will not be the last time he will ask for money, you know. But uh, also, we did not expect that he would invade the country. And that fund he, uh, funded the war. I was uh, a Kuwaiti. Uh, I left the country the third day of the invasion with my uncles and my mother. 
my late father was already abroad so during the invasion so uh, we st we stayed around 40 days in saudi arabia leaving to bahrain and then to london where i started uh, uh, my first senior year or uh, middle year at uh, at uh, at school and uh, the government they funded every kuwaiti uh, abroad you know and they gave him uh, allowances uh, allowance food allowance accommodation allowance uh, school allowance uh, you know so and that funded all that you know plus uh, funding funding the war the military war. and the liberation and the uh, comeback of kuwait and the rebuilding kuwait again so how how, how do so you rate it uh, yes no no go ahead so it made a, a it made a very good sense at the time to have this uh, this fund because a lot of countries uh, they they did not and they were reinvesting the the the, uh, the funds into yeah. into their own country but if we did they did not think about the future problem. exactly mm -hmm. and it is called the future regeneration fund yes and of course, it grew from, let's say, and then it went down from in 1990, 1991, from 100 plus billion to uh, maybe over 50 billion uh, in the year 2000, mm -hmm. uh, because of low oil prices at the time and the funding the rebuilding, the rebuild of Kuwait. I remember even after the liberation, for some time, Kuwait was not exporting oil because all of the oil wells were, were on fire. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then, uh, of course, it went down to 50 billion in the year 2000, 2001. I joined Kuwait Investment Authority, I think, in 2002 as a trainee, uh, having their training program for uh, around two years. And they send you all over the planet to do training and uh, they bring lecturers for you to, to train you uh, on investment on uh, uh, all kind of uh, of investment in the financial world and uh, uh, and now and then i i left uh, kia in 2002 but now i think the fund grew from that amount to almost uh, or over 700 billion and um, you mentioned the, the invasion and, and the oil wells burning. For how long did it burn and how difficult it was to put them out? Well, the invasion happened on the 2nd of August, 1990. Uh, and uh, it was very scary. I remember I was at my grandparents. Uh, you were with your grandmother? Yeah, I was with my grandmother. Uh, actually, uh, because that year my grandfather passed. So uh, we as a family were not traveling. We, we were in Kuwait, you know, and uh, because you, usually Kuwaitis, they travel during July and August. And that's why Saddam chose that time of year, because let's say locals are, they go down, let's say by 50%, you know? Okay. But we were here because my grandfather passed away uh, in Spain at, at, uh, at that year, you know? And, uh, and it was a very scary, you know, I never seen a tank in my life, you know, at 13 or, or uh, hearing the sound of uh, bombs or uh, artilleries, you know, and it, it was very scary to be honest. And uh, uh, we left Kuwait, we have no, no, no passports, no money, you know, uh, the credit cards were all blocked. Uh, uh, Kuwaiti dinners, nobody was, or Kuwaiti currency was, nobody was taking it, you know. And that was the most, so, one of the strongest currency in, in the world today. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, but of course, because as we said, we had neighbors, we share similar culture and similar, uh, let's say, destiny at the end of the day. So Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, all, 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 all the neighboring countries were assisting people you know mm -hmm. and the governments they were uh, 
let's say having uh, hotels being paid by the government just by by the local governments just for Kuwaitis, you know. And during during the life of the of the invasion, which is I think eight months, and uh, of course I left Kuwait in August, while we're in London. I think maybe mid of September and start school there. And even the pupils at my school in London and the teachers, they were uh, sympathizing with me, you know. And they were asking me every, every morning, ah, what's the, the news, you know? What's happening? And uh, so I lived, let's say, a, a year of my life, which I will never forget, you know? I want to talk a little bit about women in Kuwait. Um, yes. I, I've heard that women um, they have the right to vote. Uh, how, tell us a little bit more, because sometimes uh, we see in the Middle East that women don't have certain rights, and, and you tell us about how it is in your society. Well, women in our society they have the total right of, let's say, of the the difference between these two, the genders, is getting closer and closer with time, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they can vote. They can. Uh, they can, uh, We we have. We used to have women in parliament. Actually, you are surrounded by women because we have we have four daughters, right? Yes, of course. You know, uh, but <laughs> you are you are a minority. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, uh, being uh, uh, for me is very important. Women have the right, you know, being uh, surrounded by four daughters and a wife, you know. But uh, of course, uh, w the difference in gender in Kuwait is is not. Uh, it's not that big, you know, and uh, it's getting closer and closer. We have, we had women in parliament. We had women in governments um, as uh, ministers. Uh, I remember my mother used to drive since the early 70s, you know, in Kuwait. So uh, we, we did not have this uh, kind of differentiation much, you know. Uh, of of course, being being Kuwait, Kuwait is a conservative country in terms of let's say, uh, in terms of uh, uh, clothing, you know, and uh, being uh, let's say, being covered, uh, you know. I mean, uh, uh, we are we are liberal in a way, and also we are conservative in terms of uh, religion wise, you know. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your experience with home automation now. So we move a little bit from, from the sure. history and the politics. How you became an expert well, on like a technical engineer in sure. your home? I was, I was always a pro tech. You know, I bought my first computer uh, in uh, 1995. Or 1995, yes, or 1994. Uh, uh, 1994, and it was uh, uh, a big computer called Maytag at the time. And uh, of course, accessing the internet was a dial tone. You know, it was very difficult. You have to be a fast, a fast uh, keyboard typer to type the telephone number because they give you 10 or 12 telephone numbers to try one after the other because the signal is always busy. And uh, so I had this passion of computer science from a very early stage. Um, and growing up and of course, uh, you know, things have been invented, iPads, iPhones, you know, and uh, all of this thing. The pandemic, of course, made me to stay home a lot and to read a lot, you know. And of course, people read what they like. And I've been uh, reading about uh, technology and home automation and how I can improve uh, uh, the quality of, of life in my house. Yes. You know, and how can I improve the, uh, uh, how can you make things easier, you know? Uh, and I spend a lot of time, you know, uh, reading about this. 
And I came across, of course, and, and, and of course my passion for Bang & Olufsen and uh, be, being an owner of uh, several vintage and new items yes. made me uh, uh, go, uh, made, made me to read through the Bay of Living Intelligence. Reading a lot, knowing the system in a way, but who will implement it? Sure. You know, being in lockdown in Kuwait, um, I waited until after the lockdown, uh, did my research. I found out who created the system, and it was your steam company mm -hmm. in Uruguay. Yes. So I contacted the, the contact details, which was on your website. And then, uh, of course, one of your team members came back, and we started from there. We started slowly mm -hmm. for, for me to get everything ready, but we successful, we have successfully, with the help of your uh, company, uh, made it. Yeah, and, um, you, and you have a mix of systems. You have Bang & Lucen, and you have a home automation system from another brand. Which yes, you tell us of course, uh, the Bayou Living in Intelligence, or the system I installed as a home automation, for example, I have lighting systems, which is controlled by Philips mm -hmm. Dynalight system. And it was well integrated with your Bayou Living Intelligence. I have Hue lights, which are very famous in the market. And they are very well integratable with your system. My Sonfi shutters and the blinds, they are very well integrated with your system, you know. Uh, my cameras, uh, which are, let's say, uh, made by Bosch, but it's, uh, of course, the integration of the cameras is, uh, is, is uh, let's say, uh, even it can happen with any, any camera using sp specific uh, platform. And um, so far, I'm, I'm very happy, to be honest. Uh, of course, uh, it took us some time uh, on phases and we are imp improving it, but uh, uh, I am very happy with, uh, with, uh, with at least the achievement I did uh, during the pandemic, you know. You uh, used to have, you used to have a, all that integrated with Crestron, I believe. Yeah, well, I used to have uh, Crestron, uh, or unt until now I have in Crestron. But to be honest, it's um, uh, it's not customer friendly. Let's say uh, opening the Bayou Living Intelligence application, it's very easy to add products, remove products. Using it is very easy. And uh, integration is very easy. The amount of space you require being the, the small the small intelligence device of Bay Living Intelligence with the big device of Crestron, or even uh, Dynalites, for example. Dynalites, uh, I, uh, it was integrated with Crestron, but now with Bay Living Intelligence, I have integrated the Dynalites items, uh, devices which are integrated with Crestron, which I used to use two different platform uh, to, uh, to, uh, to use. Now I'm using only one, which is the Bay Living Intelligence. Great, thank you. And uh, you can show us a little bit how it works, how, how it performs? Sure, uh, I will. Um, so this is my iPhone. Uh, the, 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 this is all the zones in my house. And the pictures you took them? them uh, yeah. Most of them. Yeah. And these are the Bang & Olufsen devices. You can choose which source you want to play, uh, which speakers uh, you know you want to group together. You have the scenes where let's say in my basement, which is my home office now. Yes. Just be, before I go, I just click work. And it, it set up the light to the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what I like and the music, uh, working music, whatever source I want or the news, okay? And then when I leave, I just click the scene, you know? Yes. 
-hmm. You have the ground floor. This is the areas we are in. You know, for example, I can uh, uh, put the shutters down, put the shutters up, you know, uh, switch on the light. Uh, if you can see behind me uh, where, where it is the balcony, I can, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, put, put the shutters down. For example, let me see. Uh, and, and as you can see behind me, yes, we can see. Uh, sh sh uh, you know, it is coming down. So to be honest, and I and also you can use this, not not necessarily being connected with your Wi-Fi. You can use this, even if traveling or you're outside the home. You know. Yes. And. Uh, uh, that's it, you know, it's, uh, it's really simple. You can see the cameras, you can, you know. Uh, uh, well, the, the magic is to make it simple. It's very simple and very easy to use, you know. Yes. Even kids, they can use it, you know, but, you know, uh, even my 12 years old, even my 10 years old, if, if I taught her, if I had time to, to teach her, she, she can use it, you know. Even though you have a lot of different brands and systems. And you, but, yes. but, but from that interface, you see there's a, only one system. You don't... And not only this, the good thing is because I had, a, I had Alexa also. Alexa, Alexa. Yes. Voice control. And it's very easy to integrate, you know. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one thing, uh, Jimmy. It, it was very hard for me to, or I didn't know that I can integrate my lighting system, my Dyna lights, which are connected through Crestron, through Alexa. But now, because my lighting is integrated through Bay Living Intelligence, and my Alexa is integrated through Bay Living Intelligence, I can also control my light through Alexa using uh, uh, or utilizing the integration with the Bay Living Intelligence. So really, it, it was a nice uh, project I did, you know, and uh, yes. very happy with it. Yes. Mm. So, so you will remember the pandemic also because of this, because you elevated the quality of life in your home. Exactly, you know, of course, this was part of the thing I did during the pandemic. Uh, I improved or tried to do research how to improve the air quality in the yes. house. Yes. You know, uh, the safety. No, I find it surprising that many of the bank analysts and dealers still don't master this product. Well, that is, to be honest, uh, my first experience with Bang & Olufsen was in 1994, when I bought uh, a Bang & Olufsen TV, which I think it was called Bay Vision 7000 uh, for our house in London. And uh, when I, in that store, in that particular store, they also had the LC2 yes, uh, lighting yes. system, lighting which demon. you can control with the touch or with the, the same remote control. control of the TV. Mm -hmm. But in, at that time, at that store, they had, let's say, a push button system where you can control the light of the store and everything, also using the remote control, you know? But they they never really market, marketed them very well. In my view, they were not, uh, the, I mean, the people in there, or let's say the salesperson, they were more inclined with the speakers and TVs and uh, CD players at the time, and not the, let's say, um, the system. I think for one reason, at the beginning, it, it was system only for newly built houses. Where you can do the um, master link cable, pull it up, you know, all the way, and these kind of things, you know. But nowadays, with all this technology, you don't have, you know, my house is an existing house, you know, being built for five, six years ago. So it's uh, it is very simple to have it done, you know. Yes. And uh, but for some reasons, I think they are more inclined into selling speakers and this one and not concentrating on this because the dealer in kuwait has never seen 
I showed him the system. So he was surprised he what you did. He was surprised. Mm -hmm. So he did, he did, they did, uh, I think because they did in a hotel in Kuwait for only the suite, uh, the, uh, the suite rooms, they did with the, with the gateway, the older mm -hmm. system. Ah, the old. Yeah. But I, I don't think that one, once you live in an integrated home in which everything links together, there's no way back. And, exactly. and there's no reason, no? Because I, I, mm -hmm. actually, like, it's, it, it improves security, it, it, it improves and the quality of life. You know, nowadays, I rarely go to the wall and push the button, you know? Mm -hmm. Really, you know? Uh, even if I was next to it, it's easier for me to go into my mobile. Yes. Well, it's like uh, using your TV without remote control and having to go to the TV. Exactly. Uh, it, now, exactly. We, now we can think of doing that. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Yes. And, and you know, and uh, it was really a pleasure. And part of really my joy is to meet nice, fine people like yourself you. and your colleague, Federico. We say this. We say this. And, and uh, even during the pandemic, I met other people in Chicago for other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm doing also like uh, improving the, the, the air quality and this kind of thing. And the most importantly is meeting uh, or seeing people, new people in this pandemic, you know. Yes. Yes, the, the world is, the world has become much smaller in a sense, but much yes. richer in terms yes. of connection. And, and, also, and also, to be honest, people are friendlier, huh? Are what? People became friendlier. I mean, in a way that yes, you know, uh, let's say two years ago, it's very rare you 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 will conduct a meeting or do something using Zoom or Google Meet, for example. You know. Nice. So and now and and, and now it's uh, it's not it's not normal to meet person in. Uh, to, to meet a person in person, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. it's more normal to do it online. Yes, well, both things are very important, but uh, yes. it, 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 it brings us a lot of hope that uh, at the end we will, with all our cultural difference, which makes sense because everybody has to keep its own culture. And, exactly. And, but, but we have to become one human being and be living in this world and just helping each other and not having wars and quarantines, exactly. things like that, no? Yes, 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 exactly. Huh. And, uh, you know, and uh, of course, you you are, let's say, one of the country or one of the country in a region which I have never visited in my life before, which I will, hopefully, uh, uh, after all this uh, pandemic subsides and people get back to, to normal. Uh, of course, uh, one of the really, I think the greeniest uh, region on earth, you know, with uh, uh, with a lot of things to, to see, you know, and uh, um, so I always said to myself, I need around at least six weeks to go through the Latin America countries, you know. There are many beautiful places least, to hear visit. Yes, visit yes, here. you know, and uh, and to visit them. Yeah, you're welcome to come to my country. We will sure. pick you up the airport and, and show and you also around. We, and, and also, uh, we welcome you to Thank you. our country, you know. Of course, uh, during, uh, I think, uh, a lot of people will, will be visiting during the World Cup. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. first we have to classify. It's not easy to classify here in South America. All the countries are very good at soccer. And uh, but we hope yeah, we'll, of course, you know. we'll make yeah. it. And if we'll make it, maybe I will have the chance to go to Qatar and then visit you. Hopefully, you know, and Qatar is a very nice place, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing if you go through these countries, the six countries, they are very similar in food and uh, way of life and culture, you know, and uh, uh, they are very nice to tourists. Yes. Well, it will be amazing to visit. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'll meet you in person as well. <laughs> Whether sure. you come here or we, we go there. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, Mohamed, it was really a pleasure talking to you. Thank uh, you, Jimmy. It has been wonderful to learn a little bit about 
your culture about yourself. And you. um, we are here to help you uh, growing your experience with technology, well, whatever sure. we can. And you can sure. send us feedback uh, to improve it as sure. well. And, and I feel you are, yeah, we have an ambassador in Kuwait uh, yes, for our yes. product. <laughs> uh, and please put my email in uh, when you're putting the, uh, this video live in case any, anybody have any questions. Perfect. I'm more will, than happy. I will do to, so. Uh, sure. Thank you, thank, Jimmy. Thank you so much. My best regards. Huh? See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.